So welcome everyone to Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario's webinar. Uh, today's uh, webinar is on senior safety line providing support in the time of COVID. And I'm pleased that we're hosting this webinar in partnership with the Assaulted Women's Helpline who manages the senior safety line. So just some housekeeping uh, items before we get started. Um, as you know, all attendees are muted during the webinar. Um, and the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website uh, a couple days after the session under the training section um, and webinars will be posted. Both the PowerPoint as well as the recording will be uh, posted for people to view after. We are pleased that we do have an ASL interpreter with us today and is visual uh, throughout the session today. She will be pinned at the top if you would like to make her um, uh, graphic or uh, picture image larger. You can push, pull on the black um, borderline to make the image larger on your own screen. You have to do that individually. And you can, um, if you have problems, then we will try to help you with that uh, on our chat box. Our speakers will be visible during the presentations um, as well as the interpreter at the same time. If you have questions that you'd like to ask uh, during the session about a particular topic or issue that comes up from our presenters, you can put that in the question box. If there's an issue you just want to make a comment about, you can put that in the chat box. It just makes our um, negotiation of deciphering the questions versus just the comment a little easier for my colleague, Laura, who will be taking those question and answers at the end of the session. Um, and lastly, there will be an evaluation that pops up after the webinar just to get your feedback. And we would appreciate you taking a few moments just to provide your um, uh, comments and uh, you know suggestions for future webinars as well, because we always take that in consideration in planning future webinars. And the contact information will be available for um, EAO, EPAO, as well as um, the Assaulted Women's Helpline at the end of the session. So I am gonna turn it over to my colleague, Laura Proctor to do the land acknowledgement. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to provide uh, this this afternoon. Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. We live and work on Métis, Anishawabek, Ojibwe and Cree territories. The presence of settlers is not neutral and it had and continues to have devastating impacts on many aspects of life for Indigenous peoples. Many of our practices, including the way we care for our elders and the way we educate and the methods of creating community came to these lands through ongoing process of colonization. We now hold a new understanding in our intentions and engagements with this land and its people. There is important work being done by many nations and allies to ensure the continued thriving of all communities and knowledge systems. Those of us who are settlers need to recognize that our knowledge and way of doing things have not uh, been the priority as we work towards a safe Ontario for all seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So I just want to give a short background of our organization for those who may not be familiar with Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. Um, we had changed our name about uh, two to three years ago, so we added prevention into our name because that really is the mandate of the work that we do. We are funded through the Ontario um, government through the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. So they funded the strategy since 2003, and we continue to work collaboratively with our community partners and stakeholders and seniors in our community to implement the goals of our, our strategy. And our real underlying uh, work is really to stop abuse and restore respect. And we work with under three main priorities of that strategy, which is coordinating community services or in response. So working with our, our, our community agencies networks, not only provincially, but nationally and internationally now um, to, to improve that response and to help uh, support seniors and families and caregivers um, dealing with situations that they may come uh, um, in, in, come into their um, into their lives, but we also help agencies also um, work collaboratively together in terms of developing protocols so they can uh, know as a community how they can work with each other to respond to cases of abuse. And we do lots of training and education across various sectors. 
um, to support seniors. So um, we do that as well as public education and awareness. And um, we work with our seniors and with COVID right now, we've been doing a lot of the Seniors Without Walls programs, virtual education to get, make sure that that message of awareness and education is put in the hands of caregivers and family members so they know um, where to get support. And this uh, webinar today is a really good example uh, of that uh, work that we're doing. So at, I think it's so timely that we do these kind of sessions because especially with the senior safety line, because we know in COVID that we've seen an increase of vulnerabilities of older adults and it is putting individuals at increased risk. And there's, they feel maybe there's, they aren't able to get out and get uh, supports. So they may not have the transportation and there's limitations of isolation of family members who may have generally been there to support them. And now with COVID, the restrictions of isolation, they not, may not be able to, uh, to see the people as and family members as often as possible. So we don't really know sometimes when people are at risk or that increased risk because of that isolation that we see. So I know that the calls have gone up with the Senior Safety Line as well as our organization where people are reaching out for support because they don't know where else to go. The unfortunate part is that we've known elder abuse has, um, has occurred for many, many years. Um, and we've been working for um, and doing the work that we do at our organization to try to get that awareness out and get uh, attention, not only with uh, our community um, stakeholders and agencies, but also with media. But it's unfortunate that the pandemic has really brought this issue to the forefront. Um, people are now talking about this issue much more uh, broadly than they have in the past. But it's unfortunate it's taken pandemic and um, the emotional heartache and physical pain and neglect of some individuals um, who they trusted for um, the issue to get really uh, out there into, um, into people's living rooms and TVs and, and radios. Um, and so I think it's very timely that we continue to advocate um, for the safety and security of older adults and let them know what resources we have to support them through this, this pandemic and beyond because that's the work that we do. This doesn't just stop at uh, the pandemic. This is an important issue that, we'll, that we need to continue on. We wanna put ourselves out of business. We wanna make sure that seniors are safe, that they don't need our support. And, um, but we, we still have a long way to go in doing that. And I'm pleased that we have our speakers here today to help us understand some of the services that are available to seniors as we move towards that goal. Our first speaker is Rochella Watson. Um, she's a senior associate in community engagement and seniors initiative, um, in charge of seniors initiatives with the Assaulted Women's Helpline. Um, and uh, Rochelle is a registered um, a social worker with the College of Social Workers and um, Social Service Workers since 2007. She has over 15 years of experience working in the field, 11 years working in the world of uh, elder abuse. Um, she's also worked in areas of mental health and dementia um, and geriatrics and brain injury. She's done a lot of planning and conferences and webinars and training. So I know that you'll be pleased and get very informative education today um, through her presentation. She also works from a uh, anti-racist, anti-oppression, um, equal, um, sorry, equality-based intersectional intersectionality approach as well. So we're so thankful, Rachel, um, Rochelle, that you joined us today. And she is joined with her colleague uh, today, Latoya Dwyer, uh, who is the service support coordinator in the training and resource and outreach department um, at the Salted Women's Helpline. Um, she has seven years experience working uh, as a crisis line counselor. So maybe some of you have actually spoken with her in the past. Um, she now is the service support coordinator with that training de department. Uh, she has over nine years experience working in the community supporting uh, women in different capacities, including sh women's shelters, assisting women making healthy choices um, for themselves and for their children. So I am uh, um, happy that they're here to join us. And please, if you have questions as they go along, please um, ask uh, in the question box, because I know that they'll be uh, honored to, um, to answer them. So I'm just going to ask Rochelle to share her screen now um, and do her presentation. Hey, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Rayanne and, uh, and Laura and Francine. So my name's Rochella Watson, and I'm the Seniors Associate of Community Engagement and Seniors Initiatives with the Assaulted Women's Helpline. And I'm joined by my colleague, 
Hi, my name is Latoya Dwyer, and I work in the training and resource or reach department as a service support coordinator, as well as a relief um, crisis counselor. So thank you, Rayanne and uh, Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario for hosting this webinar today and for inviting the Assaulted Women's Helpline and specifically the Senior Safety Line. So we will have a Q&A at the end of the session. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk a little bit about the Assaulted Women's Helpline and the Senior Safety Line. We'll talk about some provincial statistics, what to expect when you call the senior safety line, the impact of COVID-19, some safety planning tips and strategies, as well as our contact information. So who we are. For over 35 years, the Assaulted Women's Helpline has served as a free, anonymous, and confidential 24-hour telephone and TTY crisis line. We also operate the senior safety line. We provide crisis counseling, safety planning, emotional support, information and referrals and we are accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 and we also have launched online counseling. We work in tandem with community partners and sister agencies towards bringing, bridging the gap in services and identifying emerging trends and issues that are relevant to the women and seniors that we work with. So we have the 24 seven provincial helpline. We have the senior safety line, the TTY line, and we have access to interpretation in over 200 languages. We recently launched our online chat counseling, which we'll, Latoya will talk about later. But we also offer training through our training resource and outreach department. And we have several partnerships with provincial, regional and local organizations. If you're interested to know about who our partners are, I'd encourage you to visit our website. So what is the Senior Safety Line? The Senior Safety Line is a program that is housed under the Assaulted Women's Helpline. And it's been in operation for over 10 years. Originally, it started as a Trillium grant and was a project in partnership with the Ontario Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse, now known as Elder Abuse uh, Prevention Ontario. And uh, so we've been continuously operating uh, this program. The Trillium grant ran out, but we continue to, to offer the service. So the Senior Safety Line provides emotional support, safety planning, information and referral. So who can call the senior safety line? Essentially anyone can call the senior safety line. You can be an older adult, it can be an older adult who's at risk, um, who is isolated. We also provide information to relatives, friends, neighbors, caregivers and service providers who are concerned about an older adult in the community. What we don't do. So unfortunately, we are not an organization uh, that is legislated to take reports of abuse. So while there's mandatory reporting in our long term care homes and retirement homes, the senior safety line does not take reports of abuse. And as we're an anonymous helpline, we do not save the caller's information. So we don't do wellness checks and we don't offer any in-person support or services. Our, our services are over the phone and are confidential. Okay, so what's new with us? Um, so on Monday, November 16th, we launched our online counseling. Um, it is available to any woman or senior in Ontario. And it's a good option if you're not comfortable using the phone. Um, using online allows you to take your time to process what you want to say, to work through how you're feeling, and to communicate with privacy in a way that is comfortable for you and where others cannot overhear you. So this is a good option for those who may be living at home with their abusers and do not want to speak on the phone for the fear of safety. So this option is available to any seniors or any, any woman that is currently living with or fleeing from abuse.
Thanks, Rochelle. Thanks, Latoya. So at the Assault of Women's Helpline, we take an intersectional, non-judgmental, anti-racist and anti-oppressive approach to services. We recognize how a person's social location can impact their ability to access services. And we work towards bridging that gap by connecting callers to services that can meet their needs. We engage with key stakeholders who provide services to our diverse communities and connect callers to them. We deliver crisis line services using an integrated analysis addressing the diverse needs of women and seniors in Ontario, specifically looking at women and seniors with disabilities, immigrant, uh, you know, immigrant communities, Black, Indigenous, uh, persons of colour, LGBTQ2S+, rural and northern women and seniors. So we look at groups that might be more marginalized and or isolated, and we work with organizations to ensure that we are aware of whether or not they provide services that are culturally relevant, uh, linguistic, linguistically going to be able to provide support as well as geographically. So we recognize on a, on a provincial scale that uh, not everybody has the same access to services, which is an equity issue. So I'm not sure uh, we've, you know, our manager of uh, resources has launched uh, this campaign out in the open uh, normally, we have our gala every year. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, we were not able to do that. And uh, this uh, campaign video was sponsored by Bell. And it really highlights the work that we do here at the Assaulted Women's Helpline and the Senior Safety Line. And it highlights uh, some of our staff here and really just reinforces the fact that we are a diverse group of uh, people that work here, um, diverse in so many different ways. Uh, and, you know, we endeavor to provide support to all women and seniors. So I'd encourage you to go to our website and take a look at the campaign video. I've also shared the link in the chat as well. So you can do, uh, Rochelle, it's in the end of the presentation. You're welcome to go visit it. Thanks so much, Latoya. So according to the World Health Organization, uh, one in seven women aged 60 plus worldwide experienced some form of abuse in the past year. And for many of you that are working in the VAW sector, you know that November is Women Abuse Prevention Month. And oftentimes the focus is on younger women. And so we really wanted to highlight that older women need to be part of the conversation. And that uh, when we look at a gender-based analysis, older women are at an increased risk due to sexist, societal, and cultural norms, where women may be seen as being inferior to men. And so when we're talking about domestic violence, we need to include older women in that conversation. And we need to recognize that an older woman could be experiencing intimate partner violence and elder abuse simultaneously. The only difference is who the perpetrator is. But we need to recognize who the perpetrator is because it comes down to addressing it from a relationship uh, you know, sort of perspective. And then we could really properly assess what uh, the risks are and safety plan appropriately. So it's really a, an interesting piece that, you know, we all collectively need to try to include older women when we're talking about violence against women. So the Ontario Association of Interval and Transitional Houses puts out an annual femicide report. And uh, what was interesting in this report between 2018 and 2019 was that out of the 37 femicides, 11 of them were older women, ages 65 plus. And I'd like to mention, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at, at their femicide report because there was a uh, quite a, a number of women that were between the ages of 50 to 64 that were also on the list. So what was interesting about this report as well is that who the perpetrators are. So in uh, out of the 11 cases, there were three sons, one grandson, one son's friend, we had four partners, and then we had one fellow male resident in a long-term care facility. 
So the fact that uh, OAIS has, you know, compiled this report is extremely helpful for us to really look at not just, you know, who these women are, but the age groups and who the perpetrators are. So thank you to them for creating this report. So oftentimes, uh, you know, in some of the more rural and, uh, and uh, remote areas, uh, people will ask us, how often do you get calls from our part of the province? So this is uh, some statistics here from 2019. And it's the, you know, the number of calls or percentage of calls that we receive based on area code. So you can see that while the majority of the calls that we receive are from the GTA, uh, we do have a large amount from the Central West in eastern Ontario, as well as 20% uh, from southwestern Ontario, and then a small percentage of uh, northern Ontario. But what's also interesting about these statistics is that we also receive 8% of our calls are outside of Ontario. So the helpline is, uh, you know, can be accessed by people that are living in other provinces, and we often do receive calls uh, from you know, family members or friends or sometimes, you know, older adults or women themselves that are living in another province where there is no helpline specific to violence against women that's provincial and or uh, for seniors as well. So we're getting calls from everywhere. So one of the things that we always try to look at when we're looking at, uh, you know, abuse, specifically elder abuse, is looking at it on, uh, you know, in these different layers. So we're using the World Health Organization's ecological model. So if we look at some risk factors on the individual level, it could be that the older adult has poor physical or mental health, that the perpetrator may have a mental disorder and or substance misuse. We look at uh, the increased risk factor for women, which we kind of touched on before, and then uh, a shared living situation. So now let's add COVID on top of that. You might have a perpetrator who has lost their job, which has caused an economic strain, which has increased their level of stress. And you may have a perpetrator who is now uh, self-medicating with substances or may have difficulty managing their stress and anger. So this can increase the risk of elder abuse on the individual level. If we look at things on the relationship level, we know that a shared living situation is a risk factor for elder abuse. But because of COVID, an older person may become more dependent on a family member or care partner because they're trying to reduce their risk of contracting uh, COVID-19. So it may have essentially, COVID-19 may have essentially forced families or people into shared uh, accommodations because of the economic strain. And this can take a toll on relationships uh, that can lead to abusive behavior. People have no escape, they have nowhere to go. Um, it, it has had a huge impact. If we look at things on the community level, um, we know that social isolation is a risk factor for abuse. It's also a consequence of abuse and a lack of social support. Now, COVID-19, because of the federal and provincial sanctions that have been imposed for us to self-isolate, um, you know, and of course we need to do this because we're trying to, you know, reduce the spread of COVID-19, but this has led to, you know, less formal supports being involved. So people that, you know, maybe had somebody that came into their home for home care, they don't have those formal supports in place. Maybe they're being quarantined or maybe they're self-isolating. And so this leaves less room for somebody to recognize the warning signs of abuse and provide support to that older adult. So the isolation is a huge, huge piece here that has, uh, you know, COVID-19 has impacted that. And then if we look at things on the societal level, uh, ageist stereotypes, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the boomer remover sort of uh, trend, uh, but ages, ageism in general pre-COVID was a huge risk factor and it still continues throughout COVID. So Latoya is going to talk about some of the risk factors from an intersectional approach. Okay. So at the Senior Safety Line, um, we recognize that people will have different identities. 
um, needs and priorities which are not static and will shift and change over time. Um, so as a result, we take approaches that offer a number of different benefits to, um, to reduce the reduction in vulnerable, vulnerability and improve our policy and practice on an ongoing basis, which includes offering different ways for our callers to connect with us, whether through the phone, um, online, or using the TTY. We also provide training and workshops to service providers. We continually connect with agency who work closely with demographic we serve. We also provide services to our callers with language barriers using interpretive services. We also connect callers with agencies who can provide them with ongoing services, for example, um, counseling services, lawyers, employment services, immigrant services, um, et cetera. Um, so at the, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, at the Assault Women's Helpline, we're also able to screen and connect women to all um, the Violence Against Women shelters in Toronto and a few other shelters, and a few other VAW shelters in Ontario. So with this collaboration, the um, we're able, sorry, with, with the VAW shelters, we're able to see beds that are available and we're able to place women who are fleeing from the violence. That's it. Thanks, Rochelle. Thanks, Latoya. So we would be remiss if we only focused on risk factors. So, uh, you know, this information on protective factors was taken from the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, uh, the Division on Violence Prevention. And so we, we also need to recognize there's risk factors, but there's also protective factors for older adults. And if we look at it again, using the World Health Organization's ecological model, if we look at things on the individual level, you know, older adults may have developed, um, you know, coping mechanisms and uh, have had more experience dealing with difficult situations and abusive situations. So on the helpline, we're really going to take a strength based focus. We're going to focus on the older adult strengths and abilities and ask some questions about what they've done in the past to cope and deal with situations like this. If we look at things on the relationship level, we recognize that a protective factor would be having a strong uh, informal social network. Um, you know, older adults may have really strong ties to different communities, whether it be cultural communities, faith communities, their actual physical neighborhood. Uh, now, of course, COVID-19 is going to impact this as we, you know, are all self-isolating and we may not be able to go out and, you know, partake in social events. So, it's a protective factor that has been damaged as a result of COVID-19. And then if we look at things on the community level, the coordination of resources and services that support older adults, you know, having a strong, uh, you know, community of agencies that are working collaboratively is a protective factor. In fact, in some areas, they have uh, elder abuse uh, intervention teams, which is a team with the police and a local social service agency, but that might have been sadly impacted by COVID-19, where potentially services are not being able to operate at the same capacity as they were before. As well as older adults who may have volunteered in the community may not have those volunteer opportunities. So COVID has definitely imp impacted things uh, on the community level. And then on the societal level, uh, you know, we continue to, you know, combat uh, age, ageism. And one thing that we can collectively do as a society is to challenge policies and systems that perpetuate elder abuse. And really what that is, is advocacy. So according to the World Health Organization, they talk about some promising interventions to, you know, dealing with elder abuse and helplines, you know, was one of the those promising interventions. So that's what we do at the senior safety line. We are a helpline that provides information and referral. It goes on to talk about safe houses and emergency shelters. In some regions, they have uh, safe beds. 
that are uh, allocated for older adults who are in abusive situations that need to leave, as well as Latoya had mentioned that uh, we are working with all the VAW shelters in the GTA, as well as some of the shelters outside of the GTA across the province. And uh, many of those shelters can accommodate uh, older women. And we also are in contact with uh, shelters that are not VAW specific as well, uh, but we have a specific program with the VAW shelters. But we, you know, one of the other recommendations is caregiver support and psychological support for persons who behave abusively. We will refer callers who are caregivers that are um, burning out to an organization that can provide support. So if they're caring for somebody with dementia, we are going to refer them to the Alzheimer's Society. If they're caring for a person with MS, we're going to refer them to the MS Society, etc. And of course, this is, this is uh, we would refer if that person um, wanted and consented to that referral. So in terms of self-help groups, we can let uh, a caller know about support groups that uh, they can join and how to get to those support groups with the eligibility criteria, et cetera, because we have those relationships with stakeholders that are providing direct services. And then of course, the interdisciplinary teams and collaborations. And so, you know, like elder abuse teams that can that are comprised of law enforcement and social service agencies. Um, you know, those, those uh, interventions are helpful and, and needed and we can let callers know about those services. Some other promising interventions uh, that were mentioned uh, in uh, the media scan of older adults in Canada during COVID-19 pandemic impacts on abuse of older and this was uh, a report that was compiled for the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. So some of the promising interventions that they touch on are the use of technology and how technology can be used to provide social support. Um, so, you know, outside of Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, uh, you know, we are providing online counseling as Latoya had mentioned earlier. So for people that are unable to talk on the phone because they are concerned about being overheard, we, we can provide that service. Another suggestion is increasing telephone contact with close friends family and voluntary organizations. So people can call the helpline, they can call more than once, they can call us, you know, whenever they need support. And then at disrespect and mistreatment, the helpline counselors will provide information to the caller about services, but we also will let them know about what abusive behavior looks like, because there's a large percentage of people who may not even recognize that they are in fact being abused. So the impact of COVID-19, I mean, this could this webinar could last for days <laughs> if we talked about the impact, but keeping it specifically to, you know, looking at uh, seniors, and again, this is taken from the same report, uh, we know that uh, long-term care homes have been greatly impacted. And, uh, you know, they need to protect their residents. Uh, they had to implement uh, a number of uh, sanctions, including a lockdown. Um, the staff have struggled. Some did not have enough personal protective equipment in the beginning. Some were sick. Some um, ex facilities experienced staff shortages because there was uh, uh, policies around workers only being able to work in one home, but you might have a worker that normally worked in three homes. So all of these things have uh, greatly impacted long-term care homes, and they do account for a large proportion of the infections and uh, the resulting deaths. Uh, we know that for older adults, when we're dealing with calls on the helpline, that there is a huge concern about the risk of contracting COVID-19. And so it's a, you know, it's a catch 22 where people are trying to balance, you know, do I try to go to the grocery store or do I ask my adult child to go to the grocery store for me? So, you know, in one way I want to be independent, but
but I'm concerned about my risk of contracting COVID-19. But then on the other end, then I have to rely on somebody else. And I'm now putting myself in a position where I'm now dependent upon somebody else, which tips the, the balance of power and control. And abuse is about power and control in a relationship. So these are the situations that older adults are facing. Some older adults are quarantined and or isolated with the person that's behaving abusively. And so again, they might not have any privacy or time to talk to someone or tell them about the abuse. And so the reduction in some of the services, um, you know, they may have some, you know, less formal support. So as I mentioned, um, they might not have somebody coming to their home to clean anymore. The, you know, there are essential services. And of course, you know, people are still receiving home care and, and cleaning uh, supports, et cetera. But some of those services have been impacted. And then there was a study done by the Mental Health Research Council that showed that there were increased rates of anxiety and depression. And that is definitely something that we're seeing uh, through the senior safety line where people are just very anxious about all of these unknowns. And then because of the isolation, people are becoming increasingly depressed. And then we would be remiss if we didn't mention the financial impact of COVID-19 for older adults. If you're on a fixed income and you know you are having to deal with now paying for grocery delivery, um, maybe you're having to pay for your home cleaner to come into your home more often, um, you're dealing with increases in uh, you know, medication, uh, you know, pharmacy fees. So all of these things can have a huge impact. When you now have uh, less independence and you have to rely on others, that can come at a cost. Not to mention, you know, for the perpetrators or for other people who may have lost their job. So there's been a lot of uh, different publications. This publication was interesting because it really highlights the impact of COVID-19 on uh, long-term care homes and caregivers. And so uh, this is an article that was taken from the Hamilton Spectator. This is a, a story that was uh, done by Maria Iqbal. And, uh, you know, it really talks about, uh, you know, caregivers and, and how burnt out, uh, you know, they are, and specifically caregivers that are caring for a person living with dementia. And so it talks about how the day programs were impacted by COVID-19. Many of them had to limit their operations. Some of them were offering uh, virtual programming. Now, anyone that's worked with somebody with a cognitive impairment knows how difficult it can be to, you know, maintain that person's attention, especially if they have, um, you know, an attention deficit or short-term memory loss. Um, there was an increase in uh, wait times for long-term care homes because many of them could not admit um, residents. So, and then there was the, the provincial restrictions that went in place in terms of visitation. And so in this story, this, uh, this gentleman talks about how hard it was when he placed his, his partner in long-term care and uh, how he wasn't really able to visit her for five months while those uh, visitor restrictions were in place and that he could only go and visit uh, through Zoom or through window visits, but it was really difficult because of her dementia for her to, you know, be able to visit in that capacity. And so it was, uh, it was very difficult for long-term care homes because of course they need to, you know, they need to limit traffic. They need to put these restrictions in place to protect the residents, but, uh, you know, it left residents isolated and it left their family members and caregivers uh, really concerned because they weren't able to to visit their family members. And so for the care partners and family members that are still in the community caring for somebody, um, it, you know, the increased risk factors include caregiver burden because of the, you know, the services not being able to operate at the same capacity. So a lack of respite, whether it's through somebody coming into your home or through, um, you know, programs such as the, the day program. And then the lack of informal and social supports. Maybe people had respite when they went to, you know, their faith institution, but now they're not able to do that. So the impact on, uh, on caregivers has been quite significant. And so when caregivers call us, our focus is really going to be on, you know, what support do they have? 
what resources do they have? What formal supports are available to them? Again, we have a database that is robust with a variety of services. And we've been checking in with those organizations to see you know, if they're still operational, uh, what impact COVID has had on service delivery, et cetera. So we're always looking at those things. What formal and informal supports do they have? What resources do they have? And can they access those services? And so this brings us to um, the impact of COVID-19 tying into ageism. So if we go back to the World Health Organization's ecological model, um, you know, society was on the outer layer there. And so really what there were some really negative, negative social media, um, you know, pitted against older adults. And uh, there was a, a writer, Andre Picard, who writes for the Globe and Mail that talks about how ageism um, is depicted in a stream of internet memes and uh, talks about how COVID-19 is a way to remove older adults. And so there was this uh, huge thing on Twitter where people were using the term boomer remover, hashtag boomer remover. And it was really the younger generation basically saying that COVID-19 is a way to get rid of older adults, um, which is extremely, um, you know, it's infuriating, it's, it's disgusting. And uh, it really ties into how ageism is, uh, you know, is pretty rampant in society. And these are things that perpetuate elder abuse on the societal level, right? Because if we are going to poke fun and think that things like this are funny and that older adults are less important, um, then we're not going to take them seriously when they tell us that they're being abused and mistreated. So this is something that we all need to tackle. And so Latoya is going to talk a little bit about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the helpline. Thanks, Rochelle. Okay, so while the quarantines are um, effective measure of infection control, it's also a greater impact on victims of abuse um, who are cohabitating with an abuser or abusers. We have experienced a number of different trends since COVID-19 has started. So at the start of COVID-19, our call volume increased but the, the length of calls decreased. Like, um, so the, they will call us, we'll get our call volume going up, but they would only be able to stay on the phone with us for like maybe a max of five minutes if we're lucky. Then they'll come off the phone because of course, everybody's at home quarantined together. Um, and for safety reasons, you cannot be on the phone for a length of time because for safety reasons. Um, so when the restrictions have lifted a little bit now, we have seen calls now where the calls have been, in, the calls have increased. Um, the duration of calls has also increased, but now these calls are changing to um, callers are inquiring how they can leave the household safely. Um, they're looking for specialized counseling services, especially for those that have kids at home that witness abuse. Um, and then permanent housing that they're looking into. How long does it take? What can I expect um, when I go to a housing health center? What information should I bring? Does the abuser know? Does the abuser have to know that I'm looking for, for a house on my own? And we also look at um, shelter. So whether it's BAW shelters, violence against women shelters, or the family shelters. Um, again, what does that look like? Have you stayed in a shelter before? Um, and do a little bit of safety planning about, like, so each phone calls that we get, we try to do as much safety planning as possible. Um, and like Rochelle was saying, like we COVID-19 is like a pandemic with another pandemic. So you got to always prepare yourself as much as possible. Um, so, but during the COVID-19, we're finding that victims and survivors of domestic violence are still, fe still feeling like they're being overlooked. Um, and they will continue to feel that way until it no longer becomes a private matter. Domestic violence is no longer private, but more a societal problem. Um, so how can we work together as a community to kind of bring awareness to violence against women and seniors, and so we can all age violence-free? That's all. Thanks, Rosa. Thanks, Latoya. So here's a graphic that shows uh, the senior safety line stats. And so this is a comparison between March, April, and May of 2019 versus March, April, and May of 2020. And you can see here on the screen that, uh, you know, the rates of calls doubled in March, tripled in April, and basically quadrupled in May. So our helpline counselors are extremely busy answering the phones and working with older adults. So our service is definitely being used. 
Latoya is going to talk a little bit about what to expect when you call the senior safety line. Thanks, Rochelle. So when you call the senior safety line and the assault women's health line, one of the trained counselors will speak with you. You can tell them the reasons for your call and you're welcome to share as much information or as little information as you like. Um, together, you and the counselor will look, look at options that are available to you should you seek information on referral or if you're simply um, looking for emotional support. We kind of want to give the callers the opportunity to take back some kind of power and control when they call the line. So this is an opportunity we give to them to like, tell us what you're calling about. What can we help you with? Um, is there support that you're looking for? Is it resources that you're looking for? How can we help you? Just to give you a little bit of power back. So, you know, to empower you. So by the time you end the phone call, you feel like you can do this. You've got this. Um, and go for it. Thanks, Latoya. So some safety planning strategies and modifications during COVID-19. So just a little disclaimer that safety planning is not a guarantee of safety. It's a set of strategies that an older adult can take to increase their safety. And as the situation evolves, the safety plan will need to be modified according to the risks and the resources that are available. So the helpline staff focus on an older adult's right to self-determination and respect their choices. As we're an anonymous helpline, we base safety planning strategies based on the information that's provided to us by the senior at that specific point in time. We don't provide case management and we only provide services over the phone. So therefore we cannot determine an older adult's capacity. Our goal is to promote safety, emotional support and information and referral. Now this was some information and suggestions taken from York Region Public Health on their publication on COVID-19 guidance for individuals experiencing abuse. And it, it was really well done because it really talks about how uh, an abuser may use the pandemic as a means of exerting power and control by either withholding information or sharing misinformation about COVID-19 or preventing the older adult from seeking uh, medical attention. It talks about how the shelters uh, have been impacted. So, you know, we are working with the shelters and some of them have had to go from 10 beds to five beds, for example, uh, because people cannot use bunk beds because we need to maintain, you know, the two meters, uh, you know, social or physical distancing. Um, people are not able to share rooms. So this has greatly impacted their uh, ability to house as many people as they normally do. And then we have older adults who may see entering the shelter as too risky, right? Um, there's also older adults with compromised immune systems who may be at a higher risk of contracting and suffering the you know, increased con consequences or complications of COVID-19. So they may not be able to access the services that they were able to access before, such as counseling services, maybe they went to the senior center, um, you know, maybe they volunteered somewhere. So they don't have the same level of quote unquote freedom of movement. And then if we look at, um, you know, things from the abusive partner, you know, they may have lost their job or their home, and they may feel justified in their abusive behavior. They may feel a, a false sense of entitlement and may see the older adult as a way to provide support to them, whether it be financially or providing, um, you know, accommodation for them, etc. So, some safety planning strategies and modifications during COVID-19 could be that we really need to counter that misinformation and let older adults know that if they are in, in immediate danger, that they can call 911 and that emergency services will respond, even if they are COVID-19 positive, even if they have symptoms and they're not sure if they have COVID-19. We're letting them know that we have the online counseling service that the shelters and in some some victim services have personal panic buttons or mobile tracking devices that a person can access. If the person's using technology, um, you know, we're giving them information about how they can be safe, you know, removing their browser history or letting them know that there might be a button on that website that says remove your tracks or escape now. 
There's a really good toolkit that was uh, created by Luke's Place that uh, has a really good uh, safety plan, uh, safety planning strategies on uh, tech abuse. Identifying safe areas of the house where there is an escape route and no weapons so that if arguments occur and escalate that they're able to get to those areas. So avoiding places like the kitchen where, you know, uh, knives or utensils can be used as a weapon. If the person is able to identify their partner and abuser or abuser's form of abuse, frequency and level of force so that they can assess the risks and physical danger. Now the helpline counselors can ask questions to help people determine what they feel their level of risk is. And then letting trusted friends and neighbors know of the situation so that they can be part of the plan. Um, so it could be something as simple as a code word that my friend calls me every day. And if I say that, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it looks like it's going to rain, that is a cue for my friend to know that something's not right. Now, we never recommend that friends and relatives or neighbors confront the abuser. Um, you know, part of that safety plan can be that that friend will call 911. So other safety planning tips can include that if the person has the vehicle and is able to drive to make a habit of backing the car into the driveway, making sure that it has gas, making sure that they have a scare a spare key. If they are unable to drive or have mobility issues to have a friend or family member who can be ready uh, to assist if possible. And then if the person is in isolation to think of realistic reasons why they can leave their home, such as grocery shopping, walking a dog, or getting medication, making photocopies of important papers, which can include their power of attorney, their will, marriage certificates, divorce certificates, etc., and having a hidden emergency bag ready that if they need to leave quickly, that they can do so. Rochella, it's the interpreter. Can you just repeat that last one? Oh, geez, that, you're going to ask me to do short term memory recall. OK, was it when in, when in isolation, think of reasons, Thank you. Would, think of reasons which would be realistic for you to leave your home. So, after that. OK, so make photocopies of important papers, um, such as a power of attorney. It could be a will. It could be a marriage certificate or a divorce certificate uh, and to have a hidden emergency bag ready that if they need to leave quickly that they have all of those those items and so keeping other items handy like their mobile cell phone uh, keys to their residence and vehicle um, having enough medication to last them for a month having access uh, to their ambulatory devices or um, any aids that assist with communication if they need those items and then having an emergency contact list and money so there are some really, it's really good research going on right now. And, uh, you know, MAP, the Center for Urban Health Solutions and St. Michael's uh, Hospital, they're, they're working on research looking specifically at safety planning during COVID-19. And they've actually put out a really good publication uh, titled Domestic Violence During uh, Public Health Emergencies. And it really talks about how you can plan for safety, how you can increase your online safety and uh, the power of connecting with others. And Dr. Patricia Ocampo is the primary investigator um, in this research. And they're hoping to develop an app which can be used uh, by anyone to support them with safety planning. So as I mentioned, anyone can call the senior safety line. We're available 24-7, uh, available with interpretation in over 200 languages. We also have a, a tab on our website, which you can visit. You can contact either Latoya and I in regards to training um, resources if your organization um, has not connected with us in terms of your services and programs, we can ensure that you're in our database. And uh, we are also on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, the Senior Safety Line specifically has its own account for Twitter and Facebook. And I'm going to pass it back to you, Ran and Laura for questions. Great, thank you so much, um, Rochelle and Latoya. That was an excellent overview of the senior safety line and um, just really even talking about the risk factors and particularly safety planning, because I think that's really uh, of importance and just bringing 
um, to light what some of the issues that you're dealing with on the safety line, because I think that's always a question like, can I call? I'm not sure. Um, so I know there are some questions and I know we're, we're shortly getting out of time, but we can go over a few minutes. Um, before I just end, I'm gonna ask um, maybe Laura to bring forward some of those questions that came up. I know you have responded to a few, Laura, but maybe they're good for just having discussion as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rochelle, for the very informative presentation. So your colleague Latoya has been great answering uh, most of the questions. So, um, <laughs> uh, so a few people are asking if you could just uh, reshare the contact information for the senior safety line. And I have a very specific question here. Any recommendations for how to work with caregivers who seem to be using COVID as a reason to um, justify escalating isolation tactics? Latoya, did you want to take that one? Sorry, my mic was off. I was oh. <laughs> so I was looking for the question. I saw the question, I was about to answer it, and then it came off the screen. So can do you mind repeating it? And can we see you, Latoya? That helps the interpreter. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, so Latoya, the question again is, any recommendations for how to work with caregivers who seem to be using COVID as a reason to justify escalating isolation tactics? Well, unfortunately, if the, if the person, if the caregiver is being abusive, you, there's no, they don't see anything that's wrong with their behaviors. So to work with them is kind of difficult because they don't see what they're doing is wrong. So the best that we can, the best thing that we can do is offer safety plan to the person who's being abused. We can, um, you know, we can let people know that their behavior can be interpreted as, as abusive behavior because sometimes because people have ageist attitudes and potentially a false sense of entitlement, they might feel that their behavior is justified. So there are times sometimes, right, Latoya, where you get calls from people who say, like, I think I'm being abusive. And so we can definitely, you know, let people know that, you know, there are other ways and strategies of coping. So maybe the person is burning out and we need to refer that person to uh, a local organization that has a support group or that can provide education specific to the ailment of the person that they're caring for. But that's only if they yeah <laughs> they if they're receptive. <laughs> exactly. Because yeah. sometimes the behavior is not my fault, it's your fault why you're making me be abusive. So therefore you need to change your behavior and not me. So if they're receptive, like Rachel was saying, then you can do all those other things. But when they're not, it's like you have to do what's best for you and provide them self-care and doing safety planning and make sure your safety plan is always up to date. And next question, LaToya already has answered it, but I think it's good for everyone um, online today to hear, uh, does the SSL line have TTY services available? Yes, we do. Yes, it's 24 hours. Wonderful. And I we're just, just had looking. A, I know I just had a question while you go through that, Laura. Um, is about the um, the translation and the multiple languages, and just letting people know how that works, because I think the, some people may not understand that process when they call so the line. When you call the line, if you have if you can't speak no no English whatsoever, we always encourage, especially doing outreach, order third party callers. So to tell the person that's calling us to just speak the language that you're looking for. So for example, you want Cantonese or something. You would just go to the phone and just and so we see a Solomon's helpline or Tina Cape line. All you say to us is Cantonese, and we will then know to get you a Cantonese interpreter. And that's and a next seamless. Question. That's a seamless uh, transfer, right? Yes, yes. So it's not a transfer. So what's going to happen is sorry to clarify. So yes, you tell us what you want. We then get interpreter on the line. We as a counselor stay on the line and we do the counseling. The interpreter is simply interpreting. They're, they're not doing a counseling session. And we stay on the line and we wait for both parties to disconnect. So they're not in communication once we end the call. So we have to stay in line for the caller to end the call and the interpreter to end the call. And then we disconnect. Okay, thank you. I'm just cognizant of time here. So I'm just gonna give one last question. Um, how would somebody go about accessing online counseling? And also, is there an option for text? Um, so online counseling, all you're simply doing is going on our website at awhl.org 
and click on online chat. You will read the little blurb. It says that because we just opened Monday. So we are only doing Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and it's not available on the weekend. Um, and if we are all busy, it will say no one is available at this time. So please try again shortly. Um, there's no texting. So we're just doing it online for now. And in the end, like maybe some, maybe texting some that we can roll out if the online chat is taking off. And for the interpreter, what does online counseling mean? Is it visual? Is it, how is it private? For, I don't understand. Is there a camera? Oh, oh, so no. So there's no, it's like, it's a text. It's a text and like, it's just a Oh, text. like typing. Yeah, yeah. I see. Yes. And, and that's all the questions for today. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much for, um, for your comments and for everybody's uh, uh, questions. Um, if there are questions that we hadn't got to or to follow up on, we can send those to uh, our speakers and ask them for more detail and follow up with you uh, individually if that's the case. Um, I did just want to highlight a couple things before we end. Um, I know uh, uh, Rochella has spoken about some of the resources, but you can reach out to obviously your local police officers and senior support officers. Um, if you're in the GTA area um, and other regions like York region and, and many across uh, Ontario, there are senior support officers. They have different titles that can help and try to um, work with you um, in solving your situation from a police perspective. Um, the supports from a legal area, the Advocacy Center for the Elderly, which many be, people may be aware of as part of legal aid, and they're very, um, very excellent lawyers who can assist in uh, looking at your legal situation and let, at least let you know what your rights are. If they themselves can't take your case on specifically, they at least give you some, some legal information. And the Law Society Referral Service will provide 30 minutes of legal free legal advice um, to a lawyer within your area based on these uh, specific legal um, information you need. So you can go on their website and request that. Um, so there's just a list of other resources. I don't need to go through all of them, but I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the specific ones. The one Rochelle had talked about the um, shelters, but the same Family Services of Toronto also has a safe bed um, that they offer. To uh, a senior, uh, there was, although it's only one bed, it is a shelter that is available for uh, men and women that people can access. So I would encourage you to go to their website and look for more information. They do some counseling as well. Um, and we work with our partners at the 519 and other LGBTQS plus organizations um, to bring awareness as the, you know, Rochelle and uh, Latoya both talked about the importance of intersectionality uh -oh. that um, we are working with many diverse organizations to bring this to the forefront as well um, and letting them know about what services are available. And just before I talk about other webinars, people do know, I think, about reporting. Um, it is mandatory. We only have legislation in long-term care and retirement homes if you see abuse that these are the agencies that you report to. We do have tools and resources similar to the Assaulted Women's Helpline. We have a safety planning toolkit that I would encourage you to also look at. I know Rochelle mentioned the York um, a uh, new protocol that they developed, um, but we developed this uh, together in the safety planning. And I think it's a good resource for people to sort of look at, um, particularly now about not being able to maybe leave depending on their circumstances. So it's on our website. We've also developed some other collaterals uh, around COVID, uh, particularly around frauds and scams, because that is a big issue. Um, and also about knowing what your legal rights are. We are excited to bring a whole series of uh, webinars within the next uh, few weeks. So the next one in terms of senior rights is on December 1st. We're working with the Advocacy Center for the Elderly um, and we'll be talking about the rights of uh, individuals in long-term care. So stay tuned, that posting will go out. Uh, we have a mailing list. I think that was asked on your uh, sign-up question, Eric, to uh, get further correspondence about upcoming events. Next week, for those who aren't familiar, um, is also the uh, recognition of victims and survivors of crime week. So we have a lineup of speakers throughout the week um, and this posting will be going out very shortly. So um, Detective Constable Martin Franson, who's online today, I see, um, is going to be one of our speakers with a caregiver and advocate who's gonna talk about a lived experience of an older adult experienced financial abuse. We are pleased that our keynote distinguished speaker is Bonnie Brandle from the United States from the National Clearinghouse of Family Violence She's done a lot of work on intimate partner violence and she's going to be talking about sort of the issues around strategies empowering older adults which really ties in with the work 
that Rochella and Latoya was talking about of that empowerment piece around um, resiliency um, in these times of, of violence that people may be experiencing. And then we are talking about risk assessment, which we, we touched on today with uh, Margaret McPherson and Tracy Marshall and on Thursday, November 26. And lastly, on Friday, we'll be having a recognition award for some of our LGBT networks in Ontario and having someone speak around um, our victims' uh, BWAP um, services in Ontario. So I thank you um, for joining us. Keep connected with us also on social media at uh, EA Prevention Ontario through uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. We are constantly posting. Laura is our uh, Facebook or our social media uh, person, as well as myself, posting information on a regular basis about upcoming events and um, uh, current issues and trends that are happening in our community. So again, I thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Um, the recording will be posted on the next couple of days on our website. Um, thank you so much. And we look forward to you joining us at our next session. And thank you, Rochella and Latoya again, and Laura for your support today. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.